Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the Royal Society and uh, to the 2007 Croonian Lecture. William Croon um, was a physician who was one of the founder members of uh, the Royal Society. He lived from 1632 until 1684. He was a physician and he worked for most of his life on the physiology of muscle. He deposited what, deposited what was referred to at the time as his little treasure, his prime opus, De Ratione Morus Musculorum, published in 1664 in the library of the Royal Society. And it, it had been my hope that I could bring it here uh, to illustrate some of his work to you, but it's regarded as too precious an item to be released in front of such an audience. <laughs> so I will, however, largely to demonstrate to you, as will become clear from tonight's lecture, I'm sure, the huge advances that have arisen in medical science in the 300 years since William Croon's time. I will just read one short uh, piece from the book, which is out there for you to look at as you leave. Talking about his theory of muscular contraction, William Croon wrote, for at the same time as the fibrils of the taut nerve are struck in the brain, immediately these droplets of liquor exude from all its branches just as when the piston of a syringe is pushed in very tightly, liquid at once spurts out. For it must be understood that the whole body is filled with spirituous and vital juices. That's medical science as it was then. I think we may be given a, a, a rather different impression uh, this evening. At his death in 1684, William Croon developed a scheme for two lectureships, one to be given at the Royal Society and the other at the Royal College of Physicians on an annual basis. Unfortunately, he did not leave funding to support these lectures. To the good fortune of the Royal Society, his wife, however, later bequeathed the means to support the scheme and indicated that the bequest was, and I quote, for the support of a lecture and illustrative experiment for the advancement of natural knowledge and lo on locomotion and, conditionally, on such other subjects as, in the opinion of the President for the time being, should be most useful in promoting the objects for which the Royal Society was instituted. Plenty of scope there then, and I'm sure that tonight's lecturer will take advantage of that scope. The first Croonian lecture was delivered in 1738. Tonight's lecture will be presented by Sir Aaron Klug. Sir Aaron graduated from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa and studied crystallography at the University of Cape Town before moving to the UK and completing his doctorate in Cambridge. In 1982, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his development of crystallographic techniques, especially those employing electron microscopy, and for his structural elucidation of biologically important nucleic acid protein complexes. Between 1986 and 1996, Aaron was the director of the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, and he was knighted in 1988. In 1995, he was appointed to the Order of Merit. From 1995 until the year 2000, he was president of our society here, and he delivered amazingly useful service to the society during that period. In 2005, Sir Aaron was awarded South Africa's highest honor, the gold medal of the Order of Makum Gubwe for his exceptional achievements in medical science. Prior to this award, very few had been awarded the medal. The first person to be awarded, in fact, was Nelson Mandela. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to present Sir Aaron Klug, who will deliver the 2007 Croonian Lecture. Am 
I switched on? Okay. Well, thank you very much, David, for his very kind words. Um, i am also like to thank the President and Council of the Society for inviting me to give the Croonian Lecture. It's an honor which I very much appreciate. I'm going to tell the story which started over 20 years ago on how curiosity-driven research in basic science led to an advance in gene therapy in the broadest sense of the term. When that term was invented, it meant that one isolated a relevant gene in an inherited genetic disease, made good copies of the gene, and then delivered them to the patient's cells or tissues. Fifteen years ago, French Anderson in the USA became the first scientist to succeed. A young girl, by, uh, Silva by name, suffered from a rather rare immune disorder in which the deficiency of an enzyme called ADA, adenosine deaminase, was likely to lead to a premature death. Anderson introduced the missing gene into the girl's white blood cells and injected them back. The treated cells did produce the enzyme, but on when the cells multiplied, they no longer produced healthy progeny. The girl still lives today and is relatively healthy, but it's necessary to receive periodic gene therapy to maintain the necessary levels of the enzyme in the blood. Since then, many hundreds of trials using this, what you might call gene addition, have been made for various diseases, but almost all have failed. As one of the practitioners is supported to have said recently, it is more hyperbole than results. Well, uh, we haven't any results, any um, confirmed results so far, but I think that the therapeutic applications of zinc fingers is likely, and I hope is likely to succeed, but it is in clinical trials. And the clinical trials are being conducted by a company called Sangamo. Uh, you can see it down here. Now I have to explain how this company comes to be because what this is is translational research. If you want to do translational research in the laboratory, you can't do it because you need large sums of money, you need access to patients and so on. So in the end, you have to deal with a biotechnology company. Um, no, no, none of the research councils would fund uh, anything more than, a, say, a pilot attempt. So um, the, to explain, oh, goodness, let's race. I'll go back again. Now, I'll just use some terminology. The zinc finger, which I'll show later, is represented symbolically here. And this recognizes DNA, and over the years we've learned to engineer it so that it recognizes DNA with very high affinity and high specificity. And one attaches to it a functional domain, a protein domain, and these are proteins, of course, uh, and I'll describe them later. And this can manipulate the gene. Activation, repression, cleavage, uh, recombination, and so on. So that's what we call a zinc finger protein. Uh, of course, if, the, if it's a rather short protein, it's often called a zinc finger peptide. So that's the terminology. And uh, some of the re results you'll see uh, do come from Sangamo. Well, here is DNA, it's very familiar. There are two chains which run in opposite directions, and of course each chain carries a sequence of the four bases which specifies the gene. Um, you'll notice that the backbones are related by a two-fold axis of symmetry into the board, so that if you rotate this 180 degrees into the board, it looks exactly the same, at least the backbone is exactly the same. And this is made use of by many transcription factors, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, the symmetry of the DNA. And the zinc fingers are quite different and lend themselves to much more uh, range of applications 
than most transcription, other transcription factors. And that's the basis why I pursued zinc fingers for many years, not because I discovered them, but because they are the most useful. Well, this is classical. This has a mind of its own. <laughs> uh, this is classical molecular biology. DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And the double chain of DNA is copied into a working copy, messenger RNA. And then by the genetic code, the, uh, the RNA is translated. This is translation, that's transcription, into the sequence of amino acids. And uh, this takes place in the cytoplasm, that takes place in the nucleus. The, um, now, the, the way that the gene is switched on is by a set of proteins represented purely symbolically here. Some of them are involved in the recognition of the immediate regulatory elements, which basically are involved in attracting the polymerase. The enzyme is going to uh, copy the, the DNA into a single chain of RNA. There are upstream elements which are called enhancers. This, these names go back historically, but the enhancer is really a gene activation uh, element, which is sometimes very far away and indeed may produce a three dimensional structure. So I'm going to talk about these transcription factors. And almost all of them, except for the zinc fingers, behave as dimers. They are dimers. This is an early result from yeast. This is a, a gene from yeast, biocystin, biosynthesis. And this shows the scheme. Uh, the, these are the chains. The chains of the DNA are represented here. And you will see that the DNA has two-fold symmetry. But so does the element to which transcription factor binds have two-fold symmetry. ATGA, ATGA. And so this is typical of almost all other transcription factors. Now, this is the crystal structure of that, of the GCN4, it's called. Uh, and you will see that this is the helix here. And that helix is sitting in the major group of the DNA. DNA has major and minor groups. And the recognition takes place. And by recognition, we mean specific binding and strong binding. Um, now, the, if you look at the... If you look at the actual atomic interactions, you'll see that this is the this is GCN4 around here, and it's binding to a site which is called AP1. And you'll see that it's a rather complex piece of serial chemistry. It isn't a simple code. And you'll see here that this thymine of, of the DNA contacts a serine and alanine. It uses a, it uses a methyl group and hydroxyl group. So it's one amino, one base to two amino acids. And in parallel, this is one amino acid, um, asparagine, which contacts two different ba uh, bases, the edges. These are the edges of the Watson-Crick bases. And the same is true of another system. Now... This has got a lightning trigger. The well, this is what I've got. Now, the zinc finger, as I said, works differently. And how did I come to discover the zinc finger or uncover it? Well, what happened is that after my work on chromatin, I looked for a system to study active chromatin. That is, chromatin, uh, which is DNA packaged in the chromosomes, was being exposed and wound in some, uh, exposed in some sense so that the, um, it was called active and was poised to be transcribed. And I looked for a system in which one could get large quantities of the material. Because if one was going to do biochemistry, and structural studies, crystallography, electromicroscopy, one needed large quantities. And molecular biologists work in microgram quantities. They run their RNA or their DNA on gels, electrophoretic patterns, 
and we wanted large quantities. And I became intrigued by the work of Brown in the States and um, also by the opportunity of speaking to Hugh Pelham, who is now in Cambridge, and came across this TF3A, transcription factor A for polymerase 3. And uh, in the Brown laboratory, uh, Pelham had shown that there was a 40 kilodalton protein which bound RNA, 5S RNA, which is the product of the 5S DNA gene. And the, the RNA is used in making ribosomes. And they had found that this 40 kilodalton protein was none other than a factor A which had been discovered in Roeder's lab, which was required for the correct transcription of the 5S RNA gene. Now, this was an interesting protein. It bound both DNA and DNA and RNA specifically. So this requires for something of a challenge. And Brown and Roeder between them showed that factor A binds to a control region of the gene. The fact that it's internal was thought to be a problem at the time, but it happens to be uh, not a, an important factor. So we began to study this uh, biochemically and physicochemically. And this led us, sorry, this led us to uh, the concept of the zinc finger, which I proposed. We found that the DNA and RNA, in order to, sorry, I'm not mastering this, in order to bind DNA and RNA, they needed the metal zinc, which we discovered. I won't say how it led to try zinc, but that's how it came about. And we found that there were 7 to 11 zinc atoms in this 40 kilodalton protein, which is quite a lot. The zinc is used by many proteins, but it's unusual to have so many zincs in a relatively small protein. And so in common with what protein chemists usually do, we began trying to cut up TF3A, the protein TF3A, by various enzymes to see if it was made up of domains. And we found that the, we found that the, it was made in pieces, or rather linked together pieces, which are three kilodalton fragments. So in the 40 kilodalton protein, you had about somewhere between seven and 11 uh, copies of a repeating unit. And this fitted in very well with the number of zincs that we had measured in this protein. And when you went on digesting the protein, you got a limber digest of three kilodalton fragments that means about 30 amino acids, and which is the same as the intermediates. So this gave an indication of a repeating zinc binding many domain structure in TF3A. And um, so, of course, my student Miller followed this up. And when the sequence of the amino acid protein, amino acid sequence came out, I looked at it by eye and could see repeating units in the protein sequence. This is the protein sequence in the one letter code. And you will see they consist that there is an introductory sequence of amino acids. There's a tail here, and there are nine repeating units. And each unit has invariant residues in it. Two cysteines, two histidines, and these are common ligands for zinc. And in between there are some hydrophobic amino acid residues, leucine and its cousin methionine. So the, uh, I have to change my glasses, sorry. I was thought I'd use the board.
And so, um, well, the, at this stage, at this stage we couldn't tell what, the, what this all meant. But uh, if we were going to produce repeating units which had a certain stability, it was clear that each of these units, biochemical units, filled it up into some self-assembling or self-limiting structure. And so this led to the idea of the thing finger. We called it the finger because, not because it looks like a finger, because it gripped to grasp the DNA. And so the zinc ligates the two cysteines to the two histidines, produces the major fold, and then the other the other his, the other phenyl, leucine, and tyrosine somehow help to fold up the structure. So this was going to be a new fold in the protein, uh, independently assembling modules, and they're structural units, repeating structural units. But the most important thing is not just the fold, but the fact that it's a new principle of DNA recognition. And here you see the nine units of TF3A, the nine zinc fingers, uh, postulated to bind 50 base pairs of DNA. Later, it was shown that, in fact, fingers um, four, five, and six are involved in binding DNA, RNA primarily, and one, two, three, and seven, eight, nine are involved in binding DNA. So you see, it's a hybrid protein. How it arose, one only knows, but it must be by lots of gene duplication. And other examples began to be found. In fact, this is the cysteine two, histidine two fingers, and you will see here is the here here is the uh, scale of evolution, and you will see the higher up that you go in the scale the more they are. And so you've got 3% in the human genome. So it's one of the most widely represented motifs in the human genome uh, compared with, say, another quite frequent motif. So the first of all, the thing is to work out the structure. That is the actual fold. And this was done by three-dimensional NMR using the DNA binding domain of a protein called SY5. And this was done by, you see the fold. It's the simplest structure you can think of because it has a beta sheet, as it's called, of two chains, two beta strands, and a helix. And the cysteines emanate from one of the beta strands. The histidines emanate from the helix, and the zinc pins the two elements together. And the hydrophobic residues, tyrosine, leucine, uh, and another phenylalanine make a very compact structure. And this explains why when one t treats the proteins with enzymes, protein enzymes, the, it's made remain stable and cuts between the fingers and not within a finger. So, if, so the finger was discovered not by computer graphics but by interpretation of biochemical um, measurements and investigations. Now, the, how does it bind DNA? Well, the crystal structure was worked out in Johns Hopkins University, Carl Pabo's group. And this is a three-finger three finger peptide. The three fingers are in a line. There, and you'll see here that they, this is, the, this is a representation of an alpha helix. This is a representation of the beta, the beta hairpin. And there are three of them. And you'll see that it lies more or less parallel to the axis of the DNA. And this is quite different from where the other factors bind. You can see here in the three-dimensional model the helix here and the DNA is being bound in a major groove. And it fits very snugly, as you can see from another view. It fits beautifully and makes these contacts. And you could go on, you could go on building more and more fingers. But in practice, 
if you try to, say, make uh, two copies of this and let them run on each other, they don't bind much more strongly. This is because there is a certain uh, lack of register as you go on building more than three figures. And this is what's found in nature. There are often proteins with many thing fingers on them, but they're in groups of three or four, separated by larger distances. This is important when, we, when I come later in the lecture. Now, so the, this is a schematic diagram of the interaction which emerged from the crystallographic study. These are three fingers, fingers one, two, and three. Here you see the beta sheet, here you see the helix, and emanating from the helix are these an arginine, what's called position minus one of the helix, glutamine position three, arginine position six, and they make contact respectively with a guanine, cytosine and guanine. And you see the thing is repeated here. Uh, and, but you see that it's not a simple alphabetic code because you'll see that this guanine here in the middle triplet, each finger binds three bases as you can see on one strand of the DNA. It uses a histidine here, and it's easy to see why, because histidine is a rather small residue. There's not much space here. There's more space at the ends of the triplet. So we set about uh, going to find what this binding was. But there was, we discovered in the laboratory from a second crystal structure by Louis Farrell and John Finch that there was, that the crystallographers Johns Hopkins had missed another interaction where from position two in the helix is bound to the second strand of the DNA. And so you see there's a rather uh, difficult situation because you have to satisfy this bond from the previous finger going to the thymine at the same time as this one, which goes to the companion on the Watson-Crick pair. And so that's, that's a restriction, but also makes it much more powerful. This gives you an extra factor in the binding. Um, and uh, that figured later when we were came in, coming to find the rules for recognition. Now, if you were thinking about building purpose-built DNA binding proteins, the advantage of the zinc fingers is that they use a modular principle, combinations of similar but distinctive units linked in tandem, and they have the simplest mode of DNA recognition. It's always one amino acid to one base pair. And that's true even with the cross-strand interaction. So this seemed the ideal thing to build purpose-built DNA binding proteins. Uh, Yen Chu, my colleague who's here, um, we used to say we could make tailor-made DNA pr uh, binding proteins. They weren't tailor-made because we couldn't predict all the rules. In the end, we had to search for the uh, protein, and we had to search for it using a repertoire selection technology. And this is a common technique where you make a large repertoire library of variants of a particular protein and through common DNA techniques. You see, you do all the, you make the thing fingers at the DNA level. You make the zinc finger constructs and then you get them into the cell by what's called transfection. So although we talk about the fingers as proteins, most of the work that's involved is in making the DNA constructs. And we have to find out how to do, how to do that to find a particular target. And there's various methods of selecting, which is one of the methods called phage display, which my colleague Winter showed worked with selecting antibodies based upon the earlier work by peptides by Smith. And the, uh, Yen Chu applied this and found that the zinc finger could fold up on the surface of the bacterial phage, which was the framework for it, and so we could use phage display. And so we set about, and the way we set about doing it was to use the ZIF-268. Here we had the target, we, we, we we replaced the middle triplet with zif 26 a binding by a, any triplet, all the possible triplets, one at a time. And at the same time, we randomized the middle, the amino acid sequence of the middle finger, which bound to the middle triplet. 
And so we built a zinc finger library. In those days, it was only a, fin a library of about 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 units. In later years, we built them up to 10 to the 10. And this shows one of the results. Can we tell with a zinc finger between triplet guanine, thymine guanine, guanine, cytosine guanine? These are two pyrimidines which are rather alike. And you can see here that there's, um, in this case, this is GTG binding. This is a binding curve, which means you have a, a different concentrations of DNA and you're binding a fixed concentration of protein. And so this discriminates. So this is GTG being discriminated from GCG and vice versa. And this is the sequence of amino acid codes of the helix, of the recognition helix. So we can distinguish between the two. All this took several years to set up and to do. And in the, so we were able to produce a stereochemical code. It wasn't a simple code. This is the early days of the code. There are all sorts of uh, conditions here. And in the end, we simply made a library of, and a physical library of zinc fingers, which could go through different triplets. Um, and to do this, Required and not something we could do easily in the laboratory. Uh, we could the principles of the method we did in the laboratory. But Yen Chu, being a rather entrepreneurial, um, he was my student and later postdoc, founded a MRC spin off company. I already talked about the business of translational research called GenDAC. Gen for gene, DAC for Greek, dactyl, uh, for finger. And so we. There, and, and there they made later on large libraries of fingers which could bind to uh, different DNA triplets. And since we now thought we knew a great deal about it, we thought we'd better have a go at actually applying it to a biological system. And in our laboratory, we had a man called Terry Rabbits who worked on cancer biology and he had a postdoc, Isidro Sanchez Garcia from Spain. And um, in the laboratory, they in their labs, they had mouse cells in which um, an oncogene had been placed. An oncogene is a variation on a gene which causes the gene to be independent of the conditions in which it's, which causes, of the cell in which it's present to grow, it's called, and so it takes over. And the, uh, the particular one we chose to study, because they had this in our companion laboratory, was called BCR ABLE. BCR is a gene, ABL is another gene, and these, this fusion gene, fusion oncogene, arises, as is common in many, uh, many diseases, genetic diseases and leukemias, because the tip of chromosome 9 and the tip gets exchanged with part of BCR. So you have a PCR able fusion. And this can be done depending upon the fusion point to produce an oncogenic protein, which is what makes the cell cancerous. And they're called P210 or P190. So we decided that if we understood all this, we should be able to target this BCR able in this particular one, P190. And we had to arrange that it wouldn't target, the, the zinc finger construct wouldn't target the BCR gene itself or the ABL gene. It has to be, it has to be, prefer the, this particular target. And I'll show you the sequences of the target. This is the sequence of BCR. Uh, and the, you'll see, um, there's a boundary here between what's called an exon and the intron and the DNA. This is BCR, and the, the join that takes place is, that they, as you can see across here, it goes across here. And so they create a new sequence. So what we are doing was to make zinc fingers, which could distinguish between this sequence and this one and that one. Well, particularly this one and each of the two parents. These are the two parents of that. And we succeeded. The way we did it was this. 
We had a nine base pair DNA site at the junction of the BCR Abel Onco gene. And we selected candidate fingers for each of the three triplets. We selected the best combination for the peptide and did binding measurements in vitro to find the discrimination. Then we, and I'll show you that. And here you see the zinc finger which is bound to the fusion oncogene, and these are the parents. So there's a factor of 20 or more in the binding capacity of the BCR compared with our parent oncogenes. And then we also went, I went to step two. Uh, was, this was to show that we were going to switch off the gene. We also used it to switch on the gene, but I haven't got time to show that. So what we did, so we have the transformed, that's the cancerous cell line. So we introduce a DNA construct for a zinc finger peptide. We put on the signal that sends it to the nucleus, and we send in a tag from which you can have antibodies. So you can see what happens to our zinc finger as it goes into the nucleus. Now, the other thing you can do is make a biochemical, a, a biological measurement, because the oncogene um, is in the, the cells are grow independently of the growth factor. You don't need growth factor, you don't need a medium, you don't need calf serum or things which you grow cells in. And so we did both. We looked at the, uh, at the cells, and this shows the BAFF3, which is the cell line. And after sending an Azing finger, after eight hours, you see the cells are beginning to break up. These are, this is an immunofluorescent diagram, and the cell is breaking up, the nucleus of the cell is breaking up. Um, whereas the control isn't affected. So we are discriminating the, between the two, uh, the two versions of the oncogene. And this was a uh, pretty vital experiment because we'd made for the first time a zinc finger which intervened in gene expression and modulation. And at this point, at Sangamo, the company I mentioned earlier, Edward Lamphier, who'd been a working in another biotechnology company, set up Sangamo as a zinc finger company. He invited Yan Chu and myself to join them, but we didn't know much about him, and we didn't. And Yen, as I said, set up the GenDAC in, in, in London using the MRC Technology Center. So the, um, this was a, a crucial experiment. So now we had a three finger, this was a three finger peptide we used. Uh, and as I said, it's not easy to make longer fingers because they get out of register. Uh, but we had to redesign the uh, our search library to take account of the cross strand interaction, which I described. I went to give the details. And we also increased the length of DNA target it's both its affinity and degree of rarity. And we had two ways of doing this. Some, you can take um, twice 3F to make a six finger protein, six fingers, six fingers. Or, but we also had a library of two fingers which came out of the redesign of the phage library. So now, what, why do we need to increase the length? Well, it's obvious. If you have a, three fingers by nine base pairs, so that in the human genome of 3,000 million bases, there'll be 260,000 times that you expect on a random genome that the same sequence will exist, and you want to discriminate it. So how many bases do you need to discriminate? You need 16 bases, and so we need to have um, a six-finger protein which will bind 18 base pairs. So we set about generating these multi zinc finger proteins, which recognize extended DNA sites with high specificity and affinity. And this took a lot of work. And as I say, some of it was done at GenDAC. It wasn't something we could do in our own lab in Cambridge. And uh, so it's, it's what we do is take a three finger and we put in a linker. You can make the linker longer, and you have to experiment with what kind of a linker to use. This is two times the three-finger strategy. Now, we have alternative strategies, as I've said. This is the 
two times three fingers, making six fingers, and manipulating the amino acids in between. This has proved a more successful strategy where we have three pairs of fingers and we manipulate those both within the finger and between the fingers, between the groups. And uh, this, is one of the, this is the most successful scheme. Uh, this is three times two. So we put in something between pairs of fingers. We put in glycine or glycine serine. And this is a linker, a standard linker, and we put in glycine or glycine serine. And we can sometimes skip a base and so on. And this was the basis of our later successes. And uh, to show you now the advantage of the three times two is this. this is a, these are the results measuring affinities. Now, for those of you who aren't chemists, this number here, if this number is large, it means that it's binding with a certain affinity. In fact, its dissociation constant is 1.1 10 to the 5 picomoles. This is against a three finger. If you actually target a six finger uh, with the two times three F, you see that you get 1.4 picomolar. It's a factor of over a thousand by going from three fingers to six fingers. But you'll see here that when you, there's not much to choose when you bind the original target. But say if your target has a mismatch, you're trying to discriminate between a target like this and a target which has three bases different. You'll see that this number is lower than that. So the 2 times 3F is, not as, is less sensitive. It was, remember, it was designed for this sequence. But now, you see 900 against 15. It's much more sensitive to changes in the DNA sequence. And so we decided that from then on, we could make libraries of two fingers. And that's what we have. We, and we made at GENDAC a library of 2,400 different pairs of fingers, which can then could be combined according to the target you wanted. And um, here's the application that came from Sangamo, where we have a, a DNA array of 20,000 genes on a chip. And uh, the, uh, the, um, this particular sequence was picked out by one of our fingers, which is a factor of, factor of six to 10 different experiments. Uh, so you could discriminate uh, pretty well single gene specificity of what we're going to aim. You see, if you're going to do gene therapy or gene intervention, you've got to make sure you hit that gene and that gene only out of 20,000 DNA genes in the cell. So here's the one of the first therapeutic applications. But before I describe this, I should say, oh, I didn't show this, some experiments were done just to convince ourselves with six finger proteins. And uh, Monica Papworth, uh, who was with us um, at the time, uh, showed that you could knock out a virus infection with a six finger much more strongly, that is, you reduce the titer by 90% with a six-finger protein, and with a three-finger protein, you reduce the virus titer by rather less. So there's no doubt that the six-finger proteins, you see, it isn't obvious the six-finger protein would necessarily be better than the three because you've got to have access to the DNA, and the DNA is packaged in chromatin. You don't know ahead of time how much the packaging is. And of course, the the thing finger will compete for binding what, what the proteins are which bind the DNA of the chromosome. So, uh, so then, uh, the, uh, now these, I'm going to show some uh, applications. Now, angiogenesis means the process of making blood vessels. And in the ordinary way, it's made out of intertheliol cells and there's a factor called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEG, V-E-G-F. And it's, uh, so what happens is that if you, um, uh, for example, uh, if you have oxygen deficiency, you go up a mountain, you find that you can, this gene gets switched on, there's a switch on, and you make more blood vessels, as simple as that. And now the 
most proteins, most genes, as you know, make proteins in pieces, make proteins in pieces. And these are called exons and introns. And so you find these are the exons. There are seven of them, which can be combined, six of them in this case, one is very low. You combine them in different proportions to produce various splicing variants. This is called splicing. And most eukaryotic genes are spliced to produce more than one protein product. Now, various companies have been trying to use these splicing variants to switch on vasculature in people with blocked arteries, to build new vasculature. And we, what the zinc fingers do, something different, they switch on the gene. The gene makes the RNA the precursor to all the different RNAs which form the different splicing variants. And what have I done? Oh. And uh, so VEG VEGF is alternatively spliced. And this is now, if you have one of the, if you, this is a mouse ear experiment. You can see in a microscope the capillary vessels in the ear of a mouse. It's very transparent. Uh, it's quite easy to see. And if this is from uh, one of the companies who are trying to develop this therapy, and you'll see that there are an increase in blood vessels, but the vessels leak. They have these patches. They aren't completely sealed. Now, this shows that a single Z, ZFP activates multiple splice variants. And uh, I'm going to go into that. That is, we did study that. And this is now the what you saw before. This is a single ZFP, which uh, switches on, activates the, the gene, rather than the whole gene. And you'll see there are new blood vessels, but they don't leak at all. They're quite stable. And this encouraged among uh, people to go ahead at Sangamo, or other collaborators with Sangamo. This is a collaboration between Sangamo and the division at Duke University. And so they now, they had a rabbit model, you can go into animal models, and the rabbits were artificially, um, well, they created basically ischemia, which means lack of blood vessels. Uh, and the and the engineered plasma, including a zinc finger, increases angiogenesis in rabbits with hind limb ischemia. And the reason for doing this is because there's a disease called peripheral arterial disease. Sometimes it's called peripheral arterial obstructive disease. And there are 8 million patients in the United States having very, with varying degrees of severity. If you have m mild it, you, uh, you're not very fit in your legs. If you're moderate, you're worse. And if you have very blocked arteries, you, have, you simply have chronic limb fatigue. It's called a chronic limb. And so the, uh, the trials are now going on, and they were started last August, and there is an 18-month double-blind trial for three classes of patients, which are being done at the, by, at the NIH, National Institute of Health in the States. And so far, well, we have, results haven't been unblinded yet, but we know that they are safe because none of the patients being treated have complained on the other hand, none of them has sprung up and said, it's a miracle, I can run again. <laughs> so, uh, so we don't know how effective it is, and uh, we'll have to see. But that's the trial that's going on. It's the first application. Now, this is, this is the previous clinical trial, is switching on a gene. Now, I'm going to show you another application, which is c editing or correcting a faulty gene, and it uses zinc finger DNA binding protein nucleases. The nuclease is an enzyme which cuts DNA, makes a double-stranded a, a, a double cut in the DNA, and through that, 
you can uh, get a zinc finger of the right construction to edit that gene. I'll show you how that's done. It makes use of a perfectly natural process by which the cell um, repairs its own DNA. And the DNA is subject to all sorts of, um, um, what's the word, hazards. There's ionizing radiation, cosmic rays, and uh, ionizing radiation, which is around us all the time, creates double-stranded breaks in the DNA. And the cell, all cells, all the cells, have elaborate machinery to repair double-stranded breaks in the DNA. And it turns out they use a process called homologous recombination to repair this using the sister chromosome, sister chromatid. You see, if you have a break in the DNA, where are you going to get a copy, a good copy of the DNA to fix it? Well, you have the sister chromosome, which has the correct uh, sequence on it. And that's called homologous recombination. And this is the way it works. This is a natural process. So if you have a double-stranded break in, the DNA, in one of the DNA, and this is a sister chromosome which gets recruited. It's a most remarkable process. There's a whole dance, choreogra choreographic ensemble, somebody called it, by which this takes place. But the chromosomes are recruited, and then the, the uh, broken end of the DNA invades invades the donor DNA, that is the, and the, it gets repaired. And now, the way that you can do this, that this means that you can change, you can carry a, a sequence into a target, and you can use that to good effect to edit a gene, a faulty gene. And I went to the, this, used to be called gene targeting because they simply added an extra chromosomal DNA if there was a missing, if there was a, a but they didn't know about double-stranded breaks at the time. And so this produced one in results that they could change the DNA sequence one in 100,000. Well, uh, now the uh, chimeric thing finger nuclease does, makes a double-stranded break and you have, so you make one artificially in the, in the target, and you have an extra chromosomal, that's a DNA donor, which is going to produce, that's going to give you a piece of DNA in the part that gets excised. And this is what's done. This, is a, this was developed by Chandra Sekhar and Johns Hopkins, and here you see Clock one is a catalytic site. It cuts, it makes a single-stranded break, and you make a dimer of this. These three fingers here and three fingers here, although in fact we use four fingers uh, to make the target more specific. And they each makes a single-stranded cut, and so you make a double-stranded cut. And then you, at the same time as you do this, you supply a donor DNA. So so you see, so this is a natural process, a multi-directed repair. If you have an X-ray, say, induced double-stranded break, then the sister chromatin, here's the sister chromatin, comes along and repairs it. Now you have zinc finger nuclease-driven homologous directed repair. And so the external DNA, which is used as a plasmid, uh, is, uh, is used to introduce the double-stranded break. Now this, you see, makes use of two natural processes. Zinc finger design is totally natural for recognizing DNA, and multi recombination is totally natural. So we're harnessing the inherent capacities, of biological capacities, to uh, correct a mutation. And the, um, the first application uh, that was made was for too severe combined immunodeficiency disease called SCID. Now these are, you must have heard of bubble babies. These are babies who have basically no developed immune system, so they fall victim to all sorts of, very early on, and they don't usually survive except in a very closed environment, in a bubble, in fact. And uh, there are quite a few patients of this. 
uh, is typically fatal in the first year of life and the children die. Now, the, this was taken because it's a single, uh, single mutation which produces this, the fault in the gene. It's rather like sickle cell hemoglobin where a single mutation in hemoglobin leads to sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait if it's any one chromosome. So this is, this is now trying to cure, if you like, if that's the right word, but to correct is the word or edit a, a deficiency. And this is the spectrum. This is the actual sequence of the gene of the pair of the, this is the gene that's going to produce the, this particular protein, which is called a gamma, IL2 or gamma is what the protein is called. And you'll see there are a lot of mutations in the particular region. And many patients, most patients are here or here. So this is the work now at Sangamo. And what's been done is to put the, the IL2 or gamma gene inside a cell, which is called 562. So these aren't taken from a child with a disease. This is a laboratory experiment. But it effectively is cell, which is very much the same um, as the mutant gene. So the idea is to take the cells from the bone marrow where the Z cells are made and ex vivo, that is outside, to correct it and then put it back in the, in the bone marrow. That hasn't been done yet, but it's been done uh, by, as people know, by simply replacing bone marrow by so-called healthy bone marrow, though there's immunological problems. That's, going, that's the aim to do it. And the, um, so, the, uh, so this is the targeting of this endogenous gene, IL-2 or gamma gene of K562. And there are various experiments here. And the experiments show the correction efficiency. This is ZFPs only, nothing happens. This is the donor, nothing happens. But when you have ZFPs uh, and the donor, you get a correction. And 18.2% of the cells were corrected. And here's another one with different combinations. Because the, the doses, so to speak, weren't known. And now you have 17.9%. And these results are astonishing. I spoke at a Nobel Symposium about this, where people are still trying to use uh, just donor DNA. And they were getting results of 0.01%. And they were pleased if they got 0.02 or 0.03%. And here we're getting... 18%, and in fact, as, as the subject was pursued, uh, at, I won't say how you, how you estimate it, but what you do is that the new DNA that you introduced is a marker in the DNA which allows it to be cut. So you can tell which is the new DNA given by the donor from the old DNA. And, uh, and this, this sudden blotting, which is a way of finding out whether the gene has been converted or edited, uh, tells you this is done after six months, that you've done it stably. So it's a stable correction. It doesn't revert. And the latest results published by Sangamo uh, in Nature in the 2005 show an astonishing 21%. So it means that uh, it's very likely that c correction may will work. But now this is being done in um, an artificial system but the, what you need to do in, uh, for a patient is to work on the primary cells, the primary cells which have this mutation. And that uh, work is in progress now. Um, the, uh, I'll just show. That's it. These are precursor cells, CD34 cells of the locus, and they've got up to in some cases, up to 10% of, uh, 10 um, efficiency, in which is pretty high. And if you can do that, if you can replace 10% of the cells with the healthy cells, they allow to grow the non-healthy cells. So it could be that gene therapy using the zinc finger-driven uh, 
of enzymes using finger-driven repair it could actually be practical. Well, there's some references here. And uh, these are the people I have to thank. This, as I say, Ian Chua mentioned several times, and my colleague, Monica Papworth, who worked on a helper simplex virus, and some people, my former student, Marcus Lynn, Michael Moore, who were at MRC Cambridge, later Jen Dack. Um, Lindsay M. Reynolds showed that you could um, combat HIV with a pretty, pretty high efficiency. This is the man who developed the zinc finger nucleases. And these are the people at Sangamo who produced those gene correction results. And it's now a robust technology. So it has moved from a laboratory to robust technology. And perhaps it will move to bedside. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron. I think um, a fascinating uh, analysis of a piece of marvelous biological detective work uh, involving bringing together many, many separate disciplines from classical biochemistry, molecular genetics, crystallography, to achieve insights which are, as Aaron says, coming to therapeutic usefulness. Um, a fascinating lecture. Uh, you will, I think, take a few questions? Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, are there, could I ask you, if there are people in the audience who would like to uh, ask a question, first put up your hand, and then a microphone will be brought to you. Right, there's one here. And is there a second person? Uh, could you bring the, yes, there's one just alongside. Could you take the other microphone to this person? Before, you, before the first person asks, because this is being live webcast, we need to have the questions organized in a, in a, a fairly marshaled way. Just here, this gentleman here on the end. So, the, so you at the back will be the first question. Thank you. Would you like to stand up? Uh, thank you. Uh, in the announcement that I saw, which is why I came, on the email that was sent to me, uh, it referred to uh, application to macular degeneration in the oh, eye. Yes. Is that correct? Could you say anything about that? I, well, I have yes, it's it. <laughs> the, yes, it's very simple. Macular degeneration in the eye occurs because new blood vessels are being formed in, over the back of the eye. And so you can stop new blood vessels being formed by, by inhibiting VEGFA. Exactly the opposite of what's done. And that's been working in animals, in, in trials. That's how that's done. It's just, again, you use a zinc finger to recognize the VEGFA. But you, instead of having an activation domain fused to the zinc finger recognition domain, you put an inhibitory domain, which was, was, done, in the, which was done in the herpes simplex virus case and also in the PCR able case. So is this, uh, are there going to be therapeutic applications? Well, it's, 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 there's applications for an IND, that's for clinical trials, with the FDA. So it's on the way. So, well, it has to be approved. Yeah, yeah. There are many others which are waiting approval from the FDA. Thank you. Was there a third question after? We have identified our second questioner. Is there anybody else that would like to? I did see a third Another hand somewhere. There was a man in front. There was this gentleman here. Ready? Yes. Good. Yes, uh, thank you, for Professor Clug. Um, in the light of the um, crystal structure of the zinc finger bind binding with uh, the double-stranded DNA, um, does the uh, zinc finger protein bind with single-stranded um, DNA or, or with RNA? No, it won't. The way that that, it depends how the finger is designed. But we did make a study of, uh, I did say that zinc fingers bind RNA. They bind the RNA, the 5S RNA, which is the product of the 5S RNA gene. 
And Lou Duo, my postdoc, figured out how they're bound. And it uses zinc fingers. We look exactly the same, but it uses different region of the zinc finger to bind either double-stranded double -stranded RNA, of which there are in RNAs of fold up into rather complex shapes. And so there's also one which recognizes bases sticking out in a loop of RNA. So there are different motifs which zinc fingers can be used to recognize. But the, um, they would be, if you wanted to target RNA, which is a folded molecule, you would, you, you'd have to know, you could, if you knew the structure, you could guess where to try, but you wouldn't know what length of protein to put in between the different fingers. It'd have to be quite a large search to do that. But zinc fingers are very versatile, and they also bind, also bind other proteins. I haven't got time to go into that. So it's a rather remarkable little uh, module. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to draw this uh, session to a close. I'm sure William Croon would have been absolutely amazed at the progress that's been made thanks to research of the kind that uh, Aaron has described over the last years. And he would have been proud indeed to think that he had sponsored such an impressive uh, lecture. Now, perhaps um, the Royal Society has its own way of thanking the speaker, but perhaps first I could ask the audience to show their appreciation to Aaron of his su superb... <laughs> way underneath, have the wherewithal to thank you ourselves directly, a certificate, thank you. and a medallion, thank inscribed, you. but not signed by Croon, uh, and you may guess what's in the envelope, oh, thank but you. some reward for your excellent presentation. Oh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Some colleagues will know that we're going to join uh, Aaron uh, for some refreshments, some well-earned refreshment for him, uh, in the welcome rooms just outside. But for the rest, thank you very much for coming, and good evening. Good, well done.